I'm so glad you said that because as you were as you were talking about that, I thought, you know what? Why do we? This is a great beer to have in the morning. Yeah, this is waffle Belgian waffles with syrup and salty, meaty bacon on the side. Pints and Pairings is brought to you in part by Word Driving and the Beer Cave. Learn more about our sponsors at hopheadshead.com slash pints and pairings. It's a little too early for the Food in the Moss show, but this is Pints and Pairings. I'm Curtis Taylor, <laughs> also known as Hophead Head. And I'm Jason Hendrick with Everybody's Hungry. You know, after you've had three or four beer samples in a row, it's always good to... Wash away the little salt. Get a yeah, get a, a little palate cleanser with some salty chips. Cape Cod, evidently, kettle kit chips are uh, are the tops. I grew up with a uh, a chip company called Dakota Style Kettle Chips, and uh, made forty miles away from me. So South Dakota had something, but do when they, you're talking, do they come in the shapes of presidents' heads? They do not. <laughs> well, not as far as you know. You have to look right. at it close. But they, they, <laughs> as far as I know, they uh, they are almost certainly made with GMOs. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> everything from South Dakota. They like. just throw that in for no, free? <laughs> I don't, yeah. That's nice. it just, it's just for free. No, <laughs> I don't know. What, I, I, abs- you know. I don't know. Other than their jalapeno, when you're talking about the jalapeno kettle chips, I don't know what the combination is between jalapeno and kettle chips, but that is a match made in heaven, and everyone should... It, should embrace that hot yes. oil crunchy crunchy potatoes right. a little sweet a little spice yeah. it's a little all there. salt and the voices you're hearing for those of you who are enjoying our podcast <laughs> that's, jo- that's all right no apologies because we're happy to have you here that's john and jen we are owners of beacon coffee company where we're recording today this is the third in our series with them about coffee and coffee beers and one we've really been enjoying the conversation with them and some of the beer that's been in front of us so much so that we forgot in the last episode, to remind you, you can follow the conversation of Pints and Pairings at hashtag Pints and Pairings and hashtag Beer Suggestioneers. Also go to our Facebook page at Pints and Pairings. It's where you're going to find all the cool broadcasts that we're doing, updates, some fun news. We have some great sponsors, too. Uh, we're going to get to those near the end of this show and let you know about people that help support this. But I want to get back into the beers, Curtis. I want to go back into this world of coffee and beer marrying together for a better product than you expect. The last yeah. segment, we were really kind of focusing on some porters that have coffee in them. This time, we're shifting to stouts, and we're going to explore the the kind of deviation of the beer style and how it's being influenced by coffee. Hmm. Right, and the biggest difference between porters and stouts is that stouts use roasted barley. Roasted barley is not a malt. It is barley that has come out of the field, and it's thrown into the kiln, and it's burned and it's burned, <laughs> and then it's burned again, and then it's thrown in on top of all of the other malt that is used for a, in, in the recipe for a stout. Porters do not use the roasted barley. They are all, it's, it's all malt, uh, although that does not necessarily mean that, you're not, that you can't find a porter that's going to taste burnt or ashy. Sure. You know, I mean, that you can really is contingent upon how long they've roasted that malt. Right. And and you can find malt that tastes that way. It like, you know, that has had all of the sugar burnt out of it. And so then it's just a carbon shell, you know. And so either way, you Starbucks go, malt. There you go. So <laughs> <laughs> Starbucks malt. So either way you go with it. These, though, between the two, you know, um, uh, st- I think stouts get the, I think stouts get the, the short end of the stick when it comes to uh, a bad rap, and and I think it's mostly from people who have a Guinness, and then they think that every single stout has to taste like a dry stout, which is one of the most light and acrid beers there uh, there and are. We're seeing right now an example, um, the first beer that we're tasting with John and Jen again. Owners and chief roasters here at Beacon Coffee Company. As experts, John, we'll, we'll definitely give you the uh, the Starbucks malt comment because as a chief roaster, you've been in the industry for well, almost 20 years. Scary as that might be, yeah. Yeah, almost 20 mm-hmm. years. A young guy, too. I mean, he's the amount he of knowledge. He started when he was eight. Yeah, when you started really <laughs> young. <laughs> the amount of knowledge you've gained throughout your journey as 16 a, and, uh, a coffee yeah, industry representative. Now. Is, is pretty vast. I mean, you know your stuff. I've seen you work at the roaster before, and the, the care, the, Curtis, the number of times he closes his eyes as he smells the beans while they're roasting mm. 
I can't count it on two hands and two feet. It's really cool to see you, John, kind of delve into that, that realm for just that split second, understanding and smelling what's going on with that coffee as it roasts. So I'm really happy to get your impression on this one. We're tasting Tioga Sequoia's um, Rush Hour. It's their breakfast stout. And Tioga Sequoia is located up in Fresno, California. This is definitely a sweeter um, approach than what we had in Smog City's Groundwork Coffee Porter in the last episode. Well, that's why I, I want, kind of what I was leading into with this this whole bitterness thing that, that people think that a stout has to be that kind of burnt bitterness. Neither one of these two. I've just tasted both of them. These are on the sweet stout range where there's residual sugar left in here. They're sweet. They've got a wonderful chocolatey sort of flavor with it. And it's it's a natural pairing to for to put a coffee in here, you know, to, to add just a, a, another layer of complexity to the already beautiful chocolatey flavors. So, John and Jen, coming from your background, what's your initial impression on this coffee? And if you were predicting or um, speculating on the process that was used, what do you think happened with this coffee and the beer? <clears throat> well, on the on the one hand, you, we're getting a little bit on the nose in the same way that we were getting it with the Smog City. Um, but I don't think that this was... Um, I don't think that the grounds were, were simply added. I, I think there was a cold brew made here. Um, but to Curtis's point... Um, while this has the color of stout and it's dark, I don't think that the coffee that was used here was roasted to anything close to uh, Viennese or, or French roast. So I, I think they've roasted it in such a way that they could get that nice, uh, sweet, chocolatey-ness uh, out of the coffee mm -hmm. and then probably did that in a, in a concentrated cold brew. Well, it's pretty mm -hmm. cool. I mean, again, leveraging your, your expertise and your history with coffee, I'm going to give you the description on the bottle, and you tell me, Jen, if your uh, your husband hit it on the nose or not. <laughs> so Rush Hour is a full-bodied breakfast stout that uses 60 pounds of fresh Col Colombiano Caldono coffee per batch. The beans are roasted and ground locally by Cafe Corazon. The coffee is then cold-pressed and infused into our chocolate milk stout, creating a creamy, bold, robust, yet silky smooth breakfast stout. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Um, <laughs> and I, I had forgotten that this was a breakfast out on top of it. So when you when you hear the term breakfast out, uh, you know, oat, oats are added sometimes to that in order to give it this silky mouthfeel that we're kind of there feeling um, a, a little sweeter. Maybe there was a little lactose added to it, which is would lend to it, it being the, the milk stouts that I was talking about. Um but it would also around, lend this it just to, I mean, just, just having lactose in there would lend it to, to pair well with coffee. Sure. Uh, there's a reason that, that, that lactose and the bittersweet chocolate notes of coffee play so well together. And it doesn't matter whether that's happening over ice or whether that's happening in hot coffee. Um, you know, this, the marriage of, of milk and coffee goes, goes all the way back to, the goats in Ethiopia, as it, as it were. They, although it was probably goat milk, not, right. not cow milk. So, Jen, do you have any um, familiarity with the Colombiano that they're talking about that's using this beer? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the Colombiano, so, so they're, they're talking about uh, that Caldano is probably the farm or the mill. Right. And but the Colombiano is a, is a varietal okay. that is, in, um, you know, indigenous for that area. Um, it's I don't a, know it's a, if it's it a typical was. Katura, oh, okay. Um, it was a introduced a hybrid. Yeah, that they yeah, created. It, yeah. Introduced the last time that Colombia went through a really bad um, rust uh, fungus outbreak. Uh, it's been a few decades now uh, when the Colombian government, which is heavily involved in the coffee production and the export of mm -hmm. coffee from Colombia, they basically financed the clear cutting of farms 
to replant those farms with coffee that with coffee varietals that would be resistant to the the roya or the rust fungus um they're a little more hardy they also these two varietals that they put together are have great cup quality so that is really important too of course you want to have varietals that will um that will resist the rust but of course you want it to taste good too so um you know they they were obviously thinking that one not Chris, I want to ask a quick question, though, um, based on something you just said a second ago, John. You're talking about hybrids. It, what's the benefit or kind of the variance in philosophy of a hybrid varietal mm-hmm. versus blending two styles of coffees together? Oh, like, okay. it, like In terms of the roast versus like getting it from the tree origin-wise as a hybrid sure. versus bringing two separate varietals together into the roasting cycle. Well... So I think we need to separate those a little bit. So first and foremost, when we're talking about hybrid varietals at origin, 99% of the time we're talking about Latin American coffees here because it's because the coffee plant is not indigenous to Latin America. It was brought from East Africa through Indonesia by the Dutch. So because of that, when coffee became commercially viable in Latin America, they had to hybridize African plants so that they would produce better. So for the same reasons that, that, you know, that we started crossing peas in order to get more peas in our pods, as it were, we, we have also hybridized the different heirloom varietals from Africa in order to have higher producing plants. And in the last 30 years, it's become very important to then either through hybridization or through grafting to to disease resistant rootstock uh to hybridize for disease resistance very similar to to wine and um citrus trees right we're grafting on something that produces your final product but the root system is really for lack of a better term rooted in a solid foundation and And, Mm -hmm. and 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 the other common theme there is when one wants to grow a fruit tree in an area of the world where it is not indigenous one has to mess with it a little bit in order to make it be successful fair enough Mm -hmm. yeah so curtis what's your impression right now of this tioga sequoia i think especially now that it's sitting because one thing that we didn't talk about previously with the coffee specific segment is how the, the flavor profile and the aroma changes as it cools in the converse as the beer warms it's going through a similar degradation and change what are, you, what are you getting out of this glass as the beer warms? Well, there's mouthfeel-wise in, in that way, there's, there's not a whole lot. I mean, this is a milk stout, so there's this, there's already this palate coating kinds of, of sensation, even if it is highly carbonated, you know, that it's going to be really hard to cut through that. And just the, as the carbonation escapes and as, as it warms, it's not going to, it's not changing the body feel. Uh, uh, a whole lot. Um, I think it's getting chocolatier, if that's a term. Maybe the chocolate's just coming to the front of the palate, right. mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's overpowering. Well, I think for that reason that you brought up, it, my mind is really shifting towards a pairing that dumbs that down a little bit. Um, you know, we always talk about desserts, and I think it, it's just an easy thing to go towards, but I think it needs some kind of biscuity aspect it needs some shortbread or it needs some pound cake or something something buttery and less chocolatey to really draw back some of those notes that we're starting to get out of the glass and when we look at meats or entrees this honestly for me would be a tougher pairing i would have to go maybe something like duck or a pheasant where the gamey bird kind of direction mm-hmm. because it's there's enough sweetness there to really heighten the sweet succulent notes of some of those game birds and that fatty oiliness but other than that it'd be tough because i think the beer might overpower most ingredients i think you're right that it's that it's going to overpower almost anything and it's uh, it'd be in a great uh, way but i mean you're going to lose out on the other item that you're trying to taste with it. a difficult pairing other than say you know as as the dessert i mean this is your dessert with your meal kind of thing um or, or as your breakfast. It yeah, I usually associate breakfast coffee or breakfast. Normally when we talk about a breakfast blend or a breakfast coffee, 
it's usually something that is, you know, there isn't anything crazy going on. It's not really light. It's not really dark. It doesn't interfere with the food. Um, it's really smooth and easy to drink. So I found, you know, when I took that first sip, I was kind of surprised because there is a lot more going on and it is heavy. And I think it would interfere with whatever you're going to eat. And there's a lot of sweetness. So yeah. When the other in there, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, that you're perceiving a lot of sweetness too. Cause the one contradiction to my last statement that I make is maybe something fiery, like some good hot pepper or like some jalapeno, Mm. almost like a, a chili sauce. Um, with a lot of heat. This would be awesome with Cindy Lou from Lou Who's Catering's braised beef cheek with five with Chinese five spice. Okay. There you go. You had it right from Beacon Coffee Company. John <laughs> says Cindy Lou's five spice beef cheeks. I I have not had them. So I haven't, but <laughs> my mouth water. It, it sounds good. You know, when you were saying something spice, uh, spicy, I've had... I'm not a, a a fan of heating up my chocolate, and so um, spicy adding cayenne or whatever it is that happens to be the spice du jour. Uh, but this one, I think, it could use just that tiny bit of of heat to to kind of clean it out. We, you know, we do have Olé. a um, we have some guajillo chili chocolate, dark chocolate Maybe that we'll we do a little tasting. that we uh, we use here for our guajillo chili mocha, and mm-hmm. I'd be happy to go grab some of that to go with the uh, with the beer. John's <laughs> gonna grab a little <laughs> nibble for us to uh, to test our theory with. I'm gonna need more beer though. Oh, uh, we can definitely accommodate <laughs> you on that one, Jen. <laughs> um, well, while Jen's pouring a, a refresher on the breakfast stout over my laptop. Um, <laughs> which steady I, hands. Yeah, steady as she goes. The other beer we have in front of us that we're going to do a, kind of a comparison against is Modern Times Black House Coffee Stout. And Modern Times is located in San Diego, California. Really um, prominent up-and-coming brewery that people are gravitating towards. As we mentioned in our introductory show, Curtis, Modern Times actually roasts their coffee for this beer in-house. It's like their proprietary roast. They have affiliation... Um, with a roaster and a coffee facility in La Jolla. John can correct me on that or give me better detail, but it's kind of cool to see that they've dedicated a coffee stout as part of their core lineup and that they're doing it in-house and controlling that variable. So John, <laughs> we're gonna taste that in a second, but I see you're munching on the chocolate in comparison to the Tioga Sequoia's Th- this is, breakfast stout. Uh, this is what that breakfast stout needed. Uh-huh. It was just that tiny bit of, of heat that you can mm-hmm. still feel. The beer actually accentuates that just a tiny, tiny bit, and it's it, it, it's a wonderful balancing agent. It, it brings everything back into alignment, and it brings uh, out a little bit of a citrusy note for me in the beer, almost like a, a lime kind of aspect. It, it kind of heightens some of that uh, mm-hmm. that brightness and mm. acidity in the beer for me, taking it out of the sweet realm. I'm really enjoying this beer now. There it is. <laughs> Not that I wasn't before. Well, and it goes well with the other one, too. So, I mean, mm-hmm. we were just talking about the modern times here, the, the Black House. These two are really similar. And if, you know, the, the one thing that between the two, uh, no, I'm good. The mm-hmm. Between the two that's missing, I mean, this just doesn't have the lactose in it and or the, the milk stoutiness. But if it... It still has a, a heavy chocolate flavor, uh, very smooth, and this would be, this would be one of those stouts that I would give to people who say, "Oh, I don't like stouts because it's bitter." And well, then, you, a lot say, of then people, you give them this beer, and you go, "No, it's it's not." A lot of people in my circles um, really are praising this coffee stout from Modern Times because of that fact. It's very balanced. It's smooth. And Jen, I'll give you, you and John both, I'll give you the breakdown because unlike a lot of locations, they're telling us the percentage of different coffees that are being used. Interesting. Nothing from Latin That's America. That's good. Um, there is a 75% Ethiopian and 25% Sumatran. Yeah. You can definitely taste the Sumatra. Which, That's what, fantastic. So tell me, what's, yeah. what, what, is the, what is it about the Sumatra that is standing out to you? And well, no, let's let's go back one more step. Yeah. How is it that you knew that there wasn't a Latin American coffee in it, first of all? And then we'll get to how you figured out that it would that you can identify the Sumatran. Well, there's a lot less body in this one. 
So that was my first clue. Um, secondly, chocolate, that's usually, I mean, I don't really get any chocolate on this, and that's really indicative of Central American coffees. But Of a very approachable chocolate, like yes. a, it's a, you know, a lot of Latin American coffees are real close, somewhere in the Valrona, like 60%. Okay. kind of range and that's and that's that's a very normal thing and sometimes one can taste a Colombian coffee versus a Costa Rican coffee and just based on how that chocolate is where it is on your palate one can say oh, this is a South American coffee this is a Central American coffee interesting and it's a lot of bit about how that chocolatiness is perceived as it's carried with the acidity in oh. the coffee. Okay. And with this one, I would almost go so far as to say that these are not washed coffees. These are naturally processed coffees. And we did not talk about that um, previously. So let's, let's delve into that a little bit and let our listeners know what that means. What, what's the difference between washed and um, naturally dry? I mean, give us the specs on green beans before is we're talking about that drying sure. cycle okay so so let's let's start with how did we do this the very first time you know thousands of years ago the very first way that we did is is we took the cherry off the coffee tree we let it dry in the sun like a raisin we dry hauled the seeds away and we roasted them okay okay when the dutch took it to indonesia they encountered humidity so the first time they took those cherries off the tree and they put them on the raised drying screens to dry in the sun, expecting that there would be a very predictable dry season as there is in the African savanna. They probably ended up with mold. Mm -hmm. They got lots of mold. They got lots of issues. Um, and so by the time they got to Latin America and they start, we start planting coffee in the middle of, of the rainforest and the jungle, literally, right. uh, had to figure out a way to, to, to process the coffee in a way that wasn't going to end with mold. So that becomes a race against time to get the seed out of the cherry and away from the fruit as quickly as possible so that the humidity or the unpredictable rain cycles don't lead to molding issues. Now, when you've got predictable dry seasons like you do in East Africa, you can raise on a, dry, on a, on a raised drying screen. Uh, with just some tarps nearby if you need to throw them over if, the, if there's a passing shower. And in most of Sumatra, most of the coffee is produced in a process that is about halfway in between the idea that we're going to let the cherry dry on the outside of the bean and the idea that we're going to take the cherry away from the flesh of the bean as quickly as possible, and then we're going to rinse any of the remaining flesh that's on that the outside pithiness. of the bean. Exactly. Okay. So in your mind, if you're, if you're trying to picture this in your head, think a piece of stone fruit. Like a peach or an like apricot. Like a peach or an apricot, right? And take the pit out. And now it's still covered in that last little bit of fruit that you, you can't get off of there. So you might soak that pit and then rinse it off. You've, you've just, in a microcosmic way, seen how you wash coffee. If you go halfway in between the two and you remove all of the flesh of the fruit, but leave that last clinging bit on there and then put it on a raised drying screen, then you're a little bit closer to the quote-unquote semi-washed way that a lot of coffees are produced in Sumatra and in Sulawesi in particular. Interesting. Yeah. And what that lends itself to is a coffee that doesn't have high, bright, acidic notes. And so if you can imagine, think back to our, our previous discussions about what happens, the difference between brewing a coffee with hot water or cold brewing a coffee into toddy. Well, you're already nixing the top 15 or 20 percent of those high notes and the brightness and the acidity when you use the cold brewed method. Now, if you start with coffee that's already really heavy, syrupy body, no bright acidic notes, and then you cold brew it, you're going to reinforce something that that coffee already has as a strong component of its flavor profile. And I think that's one of the reasons why this really blends well together. And I think that's why it works in the modern times. We were talking about, um, again, modern times tie-in with... 
I believe it's um, Eagle Rock uh, in La Jolla. I'd have to go back and look at it. I was Bird Rock. Bird Rock. Thank you. Rock. I want to say Eagle, uh, Eagle Rock's a different brewing company. It is. I know. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Are so they Bird roasting Rock. too? No, no, no. Um, what I'm intrigued by, though, again, is the fact that they're taking a, a focus and a philosophy on roasting coffee, bringing it in-house instead of outsourcing. They're bringing the roasting into their brewing facility and making a coffee stout, an oatmeal coffee stout, part of their core lineup. Um, Curtis, when we look at beers that people are loving, I wouldn't normally think that this style of beer is a mainstream selection, but Modern Times is making it work. Right. This is a, a, a niche beer, it certainly. And and coming in at 5.4%. So let's just f- let's back up and look at the, the ABVs that we've had here so far. The the Frantic is 7.3. That one there is 7.2. Uh, the coffee, the Smog City one is uh, up in the public six, 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 six 6%. And then this one is a 5%. So... Uh, that you can get the body that you're looking for and still have this coffee presence in a beer that is that light too um it's the it's all kind of i don't know an enigma to me maybe about how it's it's such a popular beer for them first of all this style and then when you look at all of the other components put together but it comes back to it that it's just this really great uh melding of these flavors that that works for it and if any one of those things had been out of whack you know out of proportion then this this beer would have been lopsided one way or the other sure. too sweet too too coffee you know not enough alcohol too thin that kind of thing i think it would be really interesting to revisit this beer year after year at about this time of the year and the reason is, this is the time of the year when all of the coffee from all over the world from the last crop cycle is landing on our shores. So it'll be interesting, especially to your point, um, Curtis, about they've, they've approached this in a very OCD way. And there's a reason that they're having to be so meticulous about it. And it's to strike that very delicate balance. Mm-hmm. So I would venture to bet that the next time that modern times does this coffee that this proportion of of ethiopia to sumatra may have to change as as the crop cycle Mm -hmm. changes they may have to tweak their coffee blend and their roast in order to keep the the end component of the beer uh, doing what they're expecting it to do in, in the coffee. That being said, Jason, you, you brought us a can of that, I don't know, what, maybe six months ago? Yeah. yeah. I don't know how long ago it was. But I have to tell you that when we drank it then, it tasted a lot more roasty. So my my opinion on that and, and knowing when they the coffee, maybe it was at the end of the life cycle of the coffee. They had to take it into the roast a little bit longer to cover up uh, the fact that maybe the coffee was a little older and kind of at the end of its life cycle and uh, to bring out some more of that flavor. So I I actually found that when we had it the first time, the coffee to be more pronounced and I couldn't taste as much of the beer. This I really enjoyed because mm. I felt like it was more balanced. Well, they're, they got to be doing something right in terms of consumer base, though, mm-hmm. because um, just yesterday from our broadcast, I mean, this is uh, Saturday the 12th of July and the 11th. They're getting ready for their anniversary party. They're releasing Black House beans, whole beans. So the roast that's used in this coffee, Mm -hmm. they're now releasing as a whole bean opportunity to consumers, Mm -hmm. along with a rye barrel aged and a red wine barrel aged offering of these same coffee beans. So that creativity wise, they're going to be giving you something that nobody else is doing. We did the, you know what? We did the same thing with Institution Ale. We, we, We bagged the coffee blend that they are putting into the frantic and labeled it as such and, and sold it and, and promoted it with them. Here's why if I were starting a micro brewery, I would put a coffee beer in my everyday lineup. Just like modern times did. Yeah. I would do it because coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world. <laughs> and it's the second most consumed beverage in the world. And so 
it makes all the sense in the world to me that a coffee beer would be part of a normal seasonal lineup for any really good microbrewery, especially in Southern California, which is fueling an awful lot of the cutting edge new coffee roasting sourcing mm-hmm. that's going on in, in our industry. So marrying yourself to another industry that is also rising at the same rapid rate makes a lot of sense to me. Sure, from a business standpoint, sure. I, I yeah, agree absolutely. with that. Absolutely. Now, I think it's a great segue into kind of our closing direction. You mentioned the institution, Ale Company's Frantic. Mm-hmm. Um, we opened our overall broadcast today, um, a couple of segments back, with their, their beer on nitro. Um, comparing it to the Tioga Sequoia coffee or breakfast stout, and Curtis, your point about the lacto and that kind of milk stout feel, the nitrogen, I think, did a very similar service to the frantic and it just makes sense to me that on some level especially for those people that aren't black coffee drinkers like we are and they like a little cream they like a little froth those are really smart ideas the nitro adds that creamy body to it what what's your take um on the frantic gen and kind of the creation process how do you determine how did you determine with institution what variety to use or what kind of roast profile to look at for their beer well, we've worked with um, a handful of uh, other microbreweries uh, in the area, and I have to tell you that I was really impressed with how genuinely interested and passionate they were about really learning as much as they could about the coffee itself, where it came from, what was the roast profile. Um, Is this brewers in general, or was this, are you oh, talking no, with specifically institution, of institution? When they, when yeah. they approached us. Um, you know, in other, in other cases, they've, you know, the breweries have kind of relied on us to say, you know, this is what we're thinking of doing. What do you suggest? Which is fine. Um, and it's worked well. But, uh, you know, Sean contacted me. We set up a time. Him, his father and his brother came in. We did a full blown cupping in the back. We cupped everything we had in house. Uh, we talked about where we're getting the coffee from, how it's grown. <clears throat> why we purchased it, what we're tasting. Uh, we talked about what they were, what kind of beers they were thinking about. So they really dove in head first to your world for a better appreciation of what they needed to get into their beer. And then we, and then we talked about what they were thinking about doing. And we talked a lot about their base beer. Right. For this. To for your the, for point the earlier then, Curtis, about the, the base needs to hold up to what's being added into it. Yeah, absolutely, and and this is an this is this is a uh, it's an it's an oaked oatmeal stout, right? Well, you know, I talked about oatmeal with with probably the breakfast because I wasn't at that time I hadn't read the label, and then on the back side of the label it says it's a milk stout, so that's where I was getting all of its its silky mouth feel. And oats is something that you can add to any brew. In fact, uh, we had one the other night. Uh, Sierra Nevada, actually, they add oats to a lot of their beers. And, it, and that's how when you're dealing with a beer that comes in at 3%, which is going to be really light and can be watery if you don't take care, if you're not careful with it, you add the oats to it and it gives it a, a, a fuller mouthfeel. So you feel like you're, you're drinking something. And so it, it, it's no surprise that that there's oats in it but when you're in so that when it's not on nitro that it still tastes the way that we're kind of having it right here if you're putting it on nitro i mean if that's the only way that it's going to be served then you can kind of forego some of that just because you get the creamy mouthfeel already Mm -hmm. well i don't know about you guys but i really enjoyed not only the conversation but the beers we've tasted and i wouldn't mind just refilling a glass and having some off-air banter because <laughs> one we're gonna need a little extra time to burn off some of these beers curtis and two we're in beacon coffee company of ventura they've got fresh brew that needs to be drank and understood more in depth <laughs> <laughs> i like i like the uh, your angle the every angle every great work. meal and every great night in our case afternoon should be ended with mm-hmm. a quality cup of coffee absolutely you know, um, if you want to learn more about Beacon, Beacon Coffee, let's see. We've got Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, beaconcoffee.com. You can go ahead and check that out. Uh, the, all of the collaborations, you know, especially on the, through the Facebook page, watching when 
when you worked with institution and then your bags when you did the the blend for them you know you can just keep up and and see what's new especially if you're traveling through this neck of the woods um, and you kind of teed one up for me because we want to get into our sponsors as we end this broadcast as well and one of our sponsors and uh, supporters of the show is food share ventura county and just for a great self-plug for both beacon and our show and everybody's hungry we just launched a brand new benefit blend for food share called eye opener and if you want to try that um cuvee coffee it's a, a blend of three different varieties go to beaconcoffee.com slash eye opener learn about that story and the benefit to our regional food bank here in town a portion of every pound sold whether it's retail to consumers or wholesale to some of our great restaurant partners in the area benefits our food bank other great sponsors for pints and pairings we got weird driving that's how curtis and i get home depending on where our broadcast location is go to weirddriving.com a quality designated driving service here in southern california gets you and your automobile home safe at the end of the night that way when you wake up in the morning the driveway has what it's supposed to have aka your car <laughs> and you're in your bed safely and if you've uh if you are able to drive and you're looking for a beer to take home you you know you got to go to uh the beer cave lo- located at village commons market that's at 231 village commons boulevard that's in camarillo california it's right off the 101 freeway if you're heading south it is seriously uh Three blocks maybe well and i think maybe it's two left turns and you're there <laughs> and these are four-way stops so you're not i mean it's not a tough left uh, left hand <laughs> turn either and then it's right hand turns to get back on the freeway and then you're home so you know make sure you stop there whenever we're in the Lauderton studios they are uh they're our beer sponsors and we want to thank uh, the lab 805 for all our great on-air signage and their help with our exposure for pints and pairings follow the conversation at hashtag pints and pairings Hashtag beer suggestion here is give us a like on Facebook. We don't want to forget about hopheadsaid.com as well. Wonderful archive location for all of our shows as well as iTunes for the podcast. But go to hopheadsaid.com slash pints and pairings. All the beer information and research you need is located there. Curtis, you are the Cicerone and headmaster of Hophead Said. Headmaster. Yeah, we want to thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, we've had a great time here Blimey, today. Blimey, where are we now? <laughs> I'm the headmaster. <laughs> what? Um, John and Jen of Beacon Coffee Company, thank you so much for hosting us today in the roasting plant. We appreciate your time and your generosity. Uh, this, yeah. it, it so has glad been you guys came by. It was really fun. It's been a, a treat to me. I've been here largely quiet, just soaking all of this in. And uh, I can't believe that it's taken me this long just to sit down and, and kind of listen to it, you know, and taking the time to learn it. So I'm glad that I was here today, too. So thank awesome. you so much well, for having me. Thanks from those of us in the caffeinated world to <laughs> Hophead and Hungry Man. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us on. Most <laughs> definitely. And uh, Curtis? You know, today I'm going to do it really well. I want to remind everyone <laughs> listening here, there, or in between that uh, to eat, drink, and be happy. We'll see you at the next four. Cheers. Pints and Pairings is brought to you in part by the Beer Cave, located at 231 Village Commons Boulevard in Camarillo, California. If you prefer a cocktail or some vino, this neighborhood market also has a great selection of premium spirits and wine, along with an attached deli for a quick sandwich to go. When you stop in, be sure to mention that you heard about them right here on the Pints and Pairing Show, and maybe grab a sandwich for me on your way out.